Surveillance of everyday life has become so pervasive that we are all part of it nowadays. As you watch this, surveillance is happening all around you, but something is changing in terms of how surveillance is practiced and understood today. New ways of thinking and talking about surveillance are emerging. I define surveillance as the complex ways in which we watch others, in which we watch ourselves, and that is done in various ways by various actors in society. The kind of surveillance we're used to talking about is also still here. You might think right now that your government is probably reviewing your text messages and internet browsing history, going through your phone contacts and online networks. Maybe private companies are collecting and mining your personal data, harvesting information from your social media profiles and online browsing habits for marketing, commerce and other purposes. Private companies play an extraordinary role, corporations, in uh, surveillance, both in terms of creating it, in terms of participating in it, and collecting information about us. But not only authorities and corporations use surveillance. Friends and acquaintances are peeping into each other's social networking profiles, watching their carefully curated life events and activities unfold therein, and keeping tabs on what's going on. This is the new reality we live in. And the interesting part, we are all contributing to this surveillance culture and no longer surprised by it. We can still be spooked by the inquisitive eyes of government and businesses, but at the same time, we want to be visible, to be seen by our friends and family. But they'll stop at nothing. Long before Snowden's controversial revelations about the intrusive surveillance activities of the NSA, we were already living in a world of sophisticated ways of monitoring and being watched. CCTV cameras operating 24-7 and perching around streets, banks, hospitals, schools, airports, parking lots and stores. GPS devices tracking employees' whereabouts and monitoring their activities. Biometric scanners controlling access to national borders and turning our bodies into passwords, and so on. Enhanced by the use of new communication and information technologies, contemporary forms of surveillance do not seem, at first glance, to challenge established democracy, nor do they exhibit dramatic displays of state power. Instead, they are seemingly innocuous and seamlessly designed into everyday products, such as our mobile phones and smart gadgets and apps. They, therefore, quietly and routinely become part of the mundane spheres of everyday life, the workplace, the school, the hospital, the community, and even the home. Big Brother is no longer the dominant metaphor for describing and understanding our surveillance culture. State surveillance is now merely one example of the multifaceted forms of contemporary surveillance practices. I coined this term tiny brothers in those early days of my studies in surveillance because it seemed to capture this idea of that rather than again the state being involved and this kind of notion that there's this looming large scary kind of thing what I was seeing was in everyday life these kind of um, small mundane kind of devices that collect enormous amounts of information from us. Our current culture of surveillance is rather diverse and concerns relations between the public authorities and citizens, corporations and consumers, as well as surveillance between friends, partners and within families. And then we talk about multi-vans, which is overvågning som der sker mellem mennesker hvor vi eh, indbyder folk til at se eh, følge med i vores liv og hvor vi også er med til at, at overvåge andre. Surveillance culture is an international phenomenon, but is also noticeable in Denmark, where a wide range of welfare related technologies and services, including the civil registration system, public health insurance, tax collection systems, and government based web tools, have become part and parcel of the Danish everyday life. Denmark er et meget overvåget samfund, og det tror jeg gælder for alle moderne stater. Det er også en måde, vi kan 
øh, håndtere samfundets udfordringer på, og det hele taget hjælpe borgeren til et bedre liv. Often talked about as a form of care and in terms of security, convenience and social welfare delivery, surveillance in Denmark has become omnipresent and embedded within almost every aspect of one's daily activities. At man betragter også det her overvågningsmekanismer som en beskyttelse, det er også langt hen, hen ad vejen, men, men det ligger altså også nogle, nogle muligheder for, for at, at man kan ryge i nogle områder, som ens betyder med risici i forhold til, til i hvert fald privatlivsfri. One thing I've been very struck by is how you've become essentially a cashless society. Bluetooth paying and other forms of um, commodity exchanges producing an enormous electronic trail of people's activities and, and uh, whereabouts. I think my sense is in Denmark, given your long history of uh, registration in the health field, for example, and others, that the Danes are uh, uh, more comfortable and there's a there's a level of trust of the state that we will protect and use the uh, data or information in a thoughtful and reasonable policy. Så ikke så meget at den almindelige dansker tænker over hvor mange data der egentlig indsamles om os og og hvordan de kan bruges. Jeg tror mere vi ser på bekvemligheden i at have nogle teknologiske løsninger der kan hjælpe os. Og så kan det godt være, at vi et eller andet sted ved, at det betaler vi for med vores privatid, men, men det synes vi så egentlig er ok. We are very trusting, um, and it's beautiful, but it's also very naive. I don't worry about this um, surveillance much. Nej, jeg synes ikke, Danmark er over vores samfund. You gotta allow for some, some kind of surveillance, if you ask me. Jeg føler mig ikke usikker med overvågningen. Set i forhold til alle de mennesker, jeg taler med nu holdt foredrag, så er den almindelige borger i Danmark fuldstændig komplet hammerende ligeglad med, hvorvidt han bliver overvåget af. Det interesserer ham ikke et døjt, og jeg hører hver eneste gang det her argument, at så længe jeg ikke har noget skjul, har jeg intet at frygte. Som, som jo er i, i princippet et, et argument, som jo under ingen omstændigheder holder. The fact that surveillance is embedded and accepted in the Danish culture is also evident in the concept and history of the CPR number a national registration mechanism which assigns a unique number to each Danish citizen and resident. I don't feel like the CPR number is meant as a surveillance tactic. I think that the security comes with this CPR number. But since it is tied into so many personal details, it, it is kind of a powerful tool. The my CPR number is for me that go in på nem i det og finde noget på mit cpr Altså hvis det kommer ud og det ligger på nettet, så vil jeg føle meget mere usikkerhed. Since its inception, the CPR number has become a necessary component of citizens' everyday life, without which they can hardly access any vital services such as healthcare and banking. Der er jo tit IT-skandaler, hvor kommuner kommer til at lægge meget følsomme oplysninger om borgerne. Og så bagefter siger, at det var også en fejl. Altså, men der er borgeren jo også øh, fuldstændig magtesløs i forhold til, at der så offentliggøres nogle meget følsomme informationer i men. The surveillance of individuals and populations begins at a very early stage and in a rather intimate way. Before the person is even born, they would have already been subjected to a host of surveillance practices. Prenatal screening and testing of pregnant women produce various data about the health of their fetuses and their potential susceptibility to diseases and developmental problems later in life. Surveillance of newborns continues at home through the growing number of available apps and devices that enables new mothers to track the health and milestones of their babies. From the latest vaccination data and diaper changes to the baby's first smile. School-aged children are also subjected to various forms of surveillance. Schools have always been involved in surveillance in the sense of keeping track of students' performance, but also their behaviors and the like. Schools in the U.S., particularly urban schools, have become uh, virtual prisons in terms of the kinds of levels of surveillance, meaning metal detectors, police presence, um, 
security guards, uh, do drug sniffing dogs. It is, uh, it is pretty mind boggling. Grunden til, at der er kommet så meget der, over, eller der er kommet mere overvågning i, i skolerne, det er, at vi har fået nogle øh, tekniske muligheder for det. We not only having uh, CCTV cameras in schools, a very overt form of surveillance of children's bodies, uh, RFID chips are now used in some schools. There's also apps such as Class Dojo, which are used in about 90% of American schools now. Students behavior in class is being monitored by teachers and then shared with parents and with the child themselves so that the child is actually encouraged to look at the comments that the teacher makes and the tracking of their behavior so it's used as a behavior modification um, app det eneste vi benytter sig her på skolen det er at vi har nogle kameraer fordi vi har haft nogle problemer med noget herværk altså her på skolen der er der overvågningskameraer på gangen og sådan noget jeg har ikke hørt nogen sige, at jeg føler mig overvåget med det der kamera der. Og vi ved jo alle sammen godt, at det, det er for det bedste, at det der kamera er der. Så. Nede ved pedalen, der kan man se sådan alle kameraerne, så vi vil egentlig kunne gå derned nu og så se, hvad de fleste elever laver. Ja, hvis pedalen ikke smider sig ud. Ja, hvis pedalen ikke smider sig ud. Og så er der jo også lærerne, som også på en måde overvåger os elever med at gå og holde øje med, hvad vi, hvad vi er i gang i. Men øh, det er jo igen, det er jo noget, de skal gøre. Det, det er jo ikke ondt min. Det er bare for at passe på os. Sådan. Her på skolen, der synes jeg, at lægerne de er en slags overvågningskamera. Og man kan jo ikke rigtig overvåge et overvågningskamera. Så... I forhold til lærernes arbejde, så øh, får vi jo implementeret her i Aarhus Kommune øh, min uddannelse, hvor at, øh, vi skal lægge årsplanerne op og næsten ned til hver eneste time. Skal vi øh, ligesom have en plan for, hvad er det for nogle mål, vi vil med den her, have med den her time? Og der kan forældrene gå ind og se, om der stemmer det så jo ens med det, som eleverne kommer hjem og fortæller om, hvad der er sket i løbet af dagen. Jeg har ikke så godt lide folk, de overvåger mig. Altså jeg vil helst ikke have, at folk de ved alting om mig, sådan lige meget hvad jeg lever. Jeg tror måske, at jeg ikke stoler så meget på mennesker, så jeg stoler nok på folk til, at jeg vil have dem til at vide præcis, hvad jeg lever hele tiden. Jeg håber, at vi kan holde overvågningen ude fra skolerne, og så det kun er med gårdvagter og den sunde fornuft rundt, at vi ikke skal have dokumenteret alt, men uh, man ved jo ikke, hvad fremtiden bringer. The framing of surveillance as care is the most evident in the context of health management, a field that has seen in recent years a rise in the use of digital technologies for delivering treatments, communicating with patients and managing health data. Digital surveillance in the field of healthcare involves things like self-tracking. So the interesting thing about self-tracking is it involves consensual forms of watching of oneself or sharing oneself with uh, one's data with others. It's not only or even mostly about uh, imposed surveillance. So in some sense, I wear them to be ready to make observations if I have to. Digital technologies can uh, heighten the surveillance potential of healthcare practices. They can generate data in much more fine-grained ways and in more automated ways. I'll talk about uh, doing some intense run training. So the big issue for me is who is generating the data, who has control over the data, who shares the data, who profits from the data. Patients and healthcare professionals are not the only actors interested in the generation and collection of health data. Increasingly, employers and health insurance companies are also attempting to harness the power of digital health technologies to monitor employees' health and lifestyle. Corporate wellness schemes and health insurance incentive programs are on the rise. Their aim is to promote health and reduce healthcare costs by encouraging people to engage in self-tracking and share their health data. I think um, the examples that we're seeing with Fitbit being used in the workplace is that um, employers give um, employees Fitbit bracelets, which measure, measures, you know, how many calories they burn in a day, how many steps they take. And they not only wear these in the, this in the workplace, but also on their time off. And even um, I saw some people, you know, could get discounts on their uh, in employee insurance if they were working or walking more. I'm quite concerned about corporate wellness programs that 
um, nudge people, encourage people to engage in self-tracking because, again, I think there's a fine line there between encouragement and coercion because the in the, in the workplace wellness programs that invite people to self-track, there's often an underlying assumption that if you don't do it, you're not being a responsible, productive worker. Wellness schemes and the self-tracking industry have been selling a particular vision of health that is reliant on narrow and arbitrary norms and assumptions about what's healthy for young and able bodies. And it's often the fittest, healthiest people who are the first to buy into these because they already can show and demonstrate that they're fit and healthy. If you're talking about the people who aren't very physically healthy, who are struggling with, you know, overweight or an injury, a back problem, then they're going to be further disadvantaged by those kinds of programs. Such developments also intensify surveillance at the workplace by providing employers with new tools for monitoring the performance and physical activities of employees. Apps such as Sapiens Buddy allow employees and their managers to see exactly how time is being spent and on what activities. The app, which is dubbed Fitbit for Work, quantifies a day's labour by constantly collecting, aggregating and analysing data regarding website visits, amount of time spent online and the programmes used. And I think what surveillance in the workplace does is that it gives employers rights to know things about you and know the way that you do things and, you know, every minute details of how you go about your day. Making a difference for Fortune 200 companies. And I live in a generation where a lot of us are not looking at a future of very stable work. That has made what employers can demand from us much greater. If I were to wear a Fitbit, but the pay was good, maybe. The way we play is also changing. Games like Pokemon Go have brought play to the heart of everyday practices, motivating an increase in physical activity by giving people a playful reason to go out and walk around. But such games have also increased the traces we leave behind. From personal information to location data, our use of digital and mobile games is enabling the generation and collection of vast amounts of information about our identities, networks and whereabouts. Generally, whenever we are interacting with internet, mobile and communication technologies, we leave digital traces behind us that can be tracked and collected by organisations whose interests range from marketing and advertising to national security. Hvis man prøver på at tælle op, og jeg prøver at bede folk en gang imellem, prøve på at være vidst om, hvor mange elektroniske spor de eftersætter sig bare i løbet af den formiddag. De vil blive chokeret over at finde ud af, at det meget ofte kommer over 100. Have you ever wondered why some online ads keep following you on the internet? Or how websites remember your preferences from visit to visit? The answer lies in the tracking tactics used by companies, including device fingerprinting and flash cookies, to profile your internet activities, customize your browsing experiences, and deliver ads that are targeted to your interests and tastes. Our digital traces and the potential use by third parties raise important issues around privacy and consent. Yet, the majority of people rarely pause to think about these issues until something drastic happens. The word privacy and the word consent is so abstract. To a lot of people, you know, if you ask them, do you care about your privacy, they'll be like, I, I guess, you know. But as soon as you lose it, it's very concrete all of a sudden. Someone stole naked pictures of me. This is what I did about it. Who should be able to see you naked? In 2011, in the fall, I was uh, hacked. My email was hacked. Someone gained entry into my email and Facebook. And on that email were pictures that I had sent to an ex-boyfriend three years before. Um, and they took those pictures along with my address, my phone number, uh, basically every sort of identifiable information you can imagine, and uploaded it to a site um, in a big folder. And it said, ruin this bitch's fucking life on it. And I don't know who did it. I don't think I'll ever know who did it. What I felt was that I had completely lost control of my own life. It was the inability to decide for myself that was extremely, extremely painful. It is not the content of the material as such. Having your consent violated is one of the foremost ways you can dehumanize a person. 
because what you say to them is, I fundamentally don't care about what you think should happen to yourself. And that's the painful part. Seeing someone's breast is not what this is about. Hvis man tager Emma Holten sagen i et etisk perspektiv, så illustrerer den jo, at privatid er utrolig vigtig for os. Øh, privatid er vigtig, fordi det giver os mulighed for at have kontrol over vores eget liv. Altså hvis jeg har kontrol over informationer med mig og hvordan de distribueres, jamen så kan jeg også kontrollere mit eget liv og hvordan jeg gerne vil have, at andre skal se mig. Og det er helt fundamentalt meget vigtigt for mennesker at have den her autonomi. I had no sense of how I could manage to get my way out of this in a way that would make me have even something that was similar to a regular life. Um, but after about two years, I kind of started getting interested in feminism, and I was very aware that there was something about exertion of power, and there was something about humiliation as a way to oppress people. And, and that kind of made it Uh, political instead of personal. In 2014, I got together with a photographer called Cecilia Budko, and I kind of floated to her over a glass of wine. You know, I had this idea that I could take new naked pictures and put them online with my consent. Well, the case of Emma Holton is an in- interesting one because she was a young woman who chose not to shut up and take it basically. So in 2014 in the fall um, we put up a new naked pictures uh, called the consent project along with an article called consent and I, th- I think what I wanted to do with the naked pictures was to say if you think this is counterintuitive you should ask yourself why. You should ask yourself why to you there is not a difference between having something done onto you and doing something yourself. Because if you don't see that difference, we obviously have a problem here. I think Emma Holton's decision to shape her own nude photos in a way that she wanted to, again, was a very brave decision and it wouldn't be for anyone. Because what I was saying is, you know, what happened to me isn't that complicated. Someone violated my privacy and they took something from me without my consent And it's actually not relevant whether I'm naked or not. It's sort of responding without shame and without sort of hiding away that that in fact one might expect a young woman in that situation to have done. And and I think the more ways that people can take charge of the representation of themselves online, the better. Each other. Pictures shared with and without this consent are completely different things. Surveillance is also about categorization and profiling, aspects that are by no means neutral or harmless. Surveillance tends to favor uh, people, I would say, maybe at the center of social life, uh, people in power, people in uh, situations in which they um, uh, might even be advantaged by it. Surveillance in this sense also raises a question about equality in that it does not affect everyone in the same way. So that once you are categorized as someone to be watched or to be um, determined as being of less value than someone else, then you are in essence kind of trapped in the machine in which you are then treated differently throughout, potentially throughout your entire life. And so places like borders are uh, incredible examples in which people with the right credentials, the right color of skin, the right uh, social class are treated in one way and others are treated as suspects and uh, questioned in terms of their documentation or lack thereof. So while surveillance is often framed as a form of care and security enhancing mechanism, It is also contributing to forms of inequality, exclusion and targeted control. Det er særligt minoriteter som er mere intenst synlige for vores overvågningssamfund. Og der er nogle uligheder som øh, udstillingen her vil forsøge at fokusere på, så vi gør os bevidste om øh, den uretfærdighed der ligger bag øh, vores overvågningssamfund i dag. Og udstillingen vil også, eller hele projektet vil også få os til at fokusere på, hvordan vi kan undgå, 
og bidrage til øget ulighed i, i vores overvågningssamfund. Do you want to live in a society in which uh, there's no crime, no terrorism, uh, no deviance, various kinds of things? We could create that society, but would anyone want to really live in it? Because in order to produce that, you would have to have a totalitarian police state. And most people, I suspect, don't want to live in that state. The way we respond to surveillance now will certainly affect its future direction. And perhaps the worst response at the moment would be complacency. Retten til at, at være i fred skal man hele tiden have med, når man tænker på, hvordan vi kan udnytte de her teknologier godt. Um, I think we have to always be concerned about various entities in society, particularly uh, governments, corporations and others, who simply have too much power, too much information about us. People change their behavior when they know they're being surveilled. And if that's like a basic feeling that everyone or someone always knows what you're doing, that may change who you are and who you become. And that's worrying. Producing what I call information asymmetries, so that organizations have more information about us than we do about them. And I think history suggests that that's a very dangerous situation. I think for me, an advice to an everyday person would be start conceiving of the internet as a political space. You are a consumer of the internet, you're a consumer of Facebook, you're a consumer of Instagram, and you have a choice in how you use it, and you can also criticize it. In terms of resistance, I think the pervasiveness of surveillance in everyday life means that that, in fact, is the locale for resistance. If we think of everyday surveillance as in our homes and in our schools and community settings, then we can resist them in those settings. Kunsten kan gøre det, at vi får et visuelt spejl, der viser os de her former for overvågning. Det kan øge vores bevidsthed. Det kan være med til at påpege nogle af de øhm, uretfærdigheder, der foregår inden for vores overvågningssamfund. I think the future of surveillance is um, uh, a one of continued struggle between folks who support freedom and openness and others who support uh, a much more um, surveilled and uh, controlled societies. Men vi kan faktisk proaktivt designe teknologier, hvor vi medtænker privatid. Og det, og det skal vi gøre. I think there are lots of reasonable, rational ways in which we can get the most from technology, but also uh, keep it in check in that sense. And whichever of these camps you decide to sit on, and whatever way you think we should deal with these issues, remember that you are also partly responsible for what becomes of surveillance culture in the future.